Okay, uh, today we're going to uh, finish or work a little further uh, on single particle orbits. So let's uh, just recall what we're into, namely single particle orbits or trajectories. Uh, so I'll call it single particle trajectories. And you may or may not remember that we had uh, basically derived an equation which governed that, which was that the parallel motion, I'll just write it down for a moment, mdv parallel dt, um, plus the perpendicular motion, mdv drift by dt, was equal to, this was after averaging over the uh, gyro motion, q times v drift cross b naught, plus the force on the guiding center. This was maybe I should have said in here, after averaging in the small gyro radius limit, after averaging over the gyro period, period, which would be uh, <coughs> 1 over omega sub c in time, or 2 pi actually. And we had had that the force on the guiding center was equal to the electric field Lorentz force. And then there was a grad B force minus mu grad B. And then finally, a curvature force mv parallel squared uh, b dot del B. And uh, I should have said, uh, or just as a commentary, that we've assumed that the magnetic field is not <coughs> varying in direction. So we set db vector by dt equals zero, where this b vector again is a unit vector along the magnetic field, so it's just b vector over b. Uh, at the end of last time, what we talked about was the parallel motion, motion along the magnetic field. So the next part we want to talk about is the, not the parallel component of this equation of motion, and maybe I'd like to um, well, sort of circle this equation kind of an important equation. So is the force on the guiding center, though, to tell you what's really in that equation. Um, but we treated the parallel part before, parallel to the magnetic field. And what we want to do is now treat the parallel or perpendicular component. And again, perpendicular, how do we get perpendicular? <clears throat> well, we take minus B cross B cross uh, whatever we want to have, take the perpendicular component of. We take B cross B cross, and that picks out with a minus sign uh, the perpendicular component. Well, if we do that to this operation on this equation, the first term clearly cancels. We get a B cross B, and that will vanish, then B in the same direction. And so our equation will become M uh, B cross dV drift uh, by dt, is equal to, and now for this term, um, what we get is uh, here we have you know b cross v cross b, and we'll get um, and we have a minus sign, and so the net result of this is it'll it'll give us q v drift perpendicular, because uh, we'll take the b cross v cross component, uh, still cross b naught actually. Um, and then finally, we'll have F guiding center uh, perpendicular. Now, um, this term over here, this dVdt, we have in mind sort of small drifts. So what we end up doing is sort of just putting this together with the, uh, the curvature drift velocity. And then if we uh, solve all of this, um, by which I mean we take another, uh, well, take B naught cross this equation here, this whole equation. And you, it's the, now the same mechanics that we've been doing before. And what you find is that the drift velocity is simply uh, the force on the guiding center cross B naught, all divided by B naught squared uh, with a Q. But if we, and, and maybe I should call this a sort of um, uh, force on the guiding center tilde, the tilde just means that I 
that I included that uh, inertial term, dv drift dt, into the force on the guiding center. But we don't need to go through all the details here, it turns out. But I just want to show you then what all this turns out to be. And the answer is that then the guiding center first has an, um, or the force on the guiding center has this electric field force. And so, therefore, we're going to get our standard, and it has a Q in front of it, our standard E naught, actually it's E naught there, E naught cross B naught, that just means at the guiding center, divided by B naught squared. So that's our standard E cross B drift. And then the rest of these terms uh, give us some other interesting things. So they're 1 over Q B naught squared times mu grad B. So that's a grad B drift. Ah, got a little bit of a problem here. I needed to put a B naught cross in here. So let's do this. Eh, sorry. We'll do this down on the next line. How then? So plus um, one over Q B naught squared times B naught cross. And then there's various terms. There's a mu grad B. Then there's uh, M V parallel squared B dot del B. So these are just reflecting that there was an, an electric field force, so there's an E cross B drift caused by that. There's a mu grad B force because I'm moving into an inhomogeneous magnetic field at nearly constant magnetic moment, so that gives me a B cross grad B. Then there's a curvature force, and then I get a B cross curvature. And the only other part is I have to take care of this... Uh, um, polarization, or I'm sorry, this uh, inertial term, which then becomes uh, plus m uh, dv drift by dt. And you see this is unfortunately sort of uh, awkward in that it is a, um, a recursive sort of thing. I have to know the drift velocity in order to plug it in here in order to know what this last term is. But pragmatically, that's uh, not much of a problem. Um, so let me just label these various terms. Uh, this one is the E naught cross B drift. And you remember when we have had a homogeneous electric and magnetic fields, that one's perfectly reasonable. That's just our usual E cross B drift. Everything else here has to do with either time variation, d by dt, or spatial variation, gradients. So remember previously we treated a homogeneous field. So we didn't have any of this stuff on the second line. But when we have an uh, inhomogeneous magnetic field and a time-dependent drift velocity, then we get these other terms. This is known as the grad B drift, uh, meaning that it's, in the, it's a force in the grad B direction. And then we have a B cross grad B drift. This one is known as the uh, curvature drift. And the final one is known as the polarization drift, or a f simplified form of it. So at this moment, I'll just call it an inertia, inertial uh, drift. You can see that's getting a little bit hard to read, unfortunately. Anyway, that's an inertial uh, drift. Now, usually we don't... This is the, the, the more rigorous way of writing these things, but most of the time you got relatively simpler situations, and so we can uh, simplify this stuff a bit. So let's uh, call this uh, simplify a bit. Namely, uh, to look at these, um, this mu grad B and the curvature and so forth and so on, um, I guess I don't want to go through all the, the algebra, but let me just uh, sketch how this works, and then we'll sort of talk about it. So what I want to do is talk about this B dot del B term, or the curvature. And let us imagine that we had a magnetic field line, 
and uh, we choose some particular uh, directions in this business. So um, this will be, say, an X direction, and this will be a, a Z direction. And we're always choosing the magnetic field to be instantaneously right along the Z direction. But let's suppose that I have a, a magnetic field that looks like this. Where would the curvature vector be for that? Well, intuitively, the curvature vector should be a vector which points from the center of the circle, which would describe that arc, to that arc. Okay, So there'd be some point up here, and there'd be some curvature vector, r sub c, that goes from the center of the circle. And of course, I never make it quite right circle, but we won't worry about that. And if I wanted to uh, define, I, I want to show you that this is the, the curvature. So if I had uh, b dot del b, so what I'm trying to simplify is the curvature. So if I look at b dot del b, and maybe I should look at it in bigger form so we can see it. So we get b dot del uh, b. Well, this b vector is equal to b naught of z in the z hat direction. Um, but it's also uh, plus maybe some bx in the x hat direction. Okay, Because if I just look at this diagram, you know, the field isn't right at the origin. It may only be right along the z axis. But as I move along, it's got a little curvature to it. And so it moves up a bit. So if I then think about this, uh, this is effectively saying that this is um, b dot del, and I'm going to measure it about there. So this is roughly the derivative as I move along the field line or in the z direction. And the b vector is the direction over the magnitude. So this will become d by dz partial d by dz. And um, the part I, I have to care about, uh, it turns out, is not the b naught um, or the, the bz, but rather it's the bx over b. And so, so this, is, this is the, actually I should make it, this is roughly that. Uh, there's no z dependence to lowest order. Now, if I now just construct a little, you know, geometry over here, then if I go some distance delta z and some delta distance up delta x, then, you know, I've created a certain amount uh, b sub x. Uh, you know, the magnetic field has a b sub x. So what I would find is that just from the geometry, and I should have had that point going to that point, but anyway, uh, what I would have is that delta x over delta z is equal to uh, bx over b. Or I should say actually delta bx, because it's the change in bx from the point here where it's actually 0 up to that point. Well, this tells me that this magnitude of the radius of curvature is, in fact, uh, 1 over b um, delta bx divided by delta z. Because the delta x is approximately my, my radius of curvature. So if you just work through that, that's what you'll get. Well, the, the moral to this story, then, is that we can uh, write this quantity which I told you was curvature, but didn't sort of tell you much about it. We can write this quantity b dot del b is often defined as something which is called the curvature vector kappa. And it turns out that it's equal to minus this radius of curvature vector. So it's actually in that direction, divided by the magnitude of the radius of curvature vector squared. So in magnitude, the curvature is 1 over the radius of curvature. So magnitude kappa is 1 over radius of curvature. But in direction, 
it's minus the direction from the center to the field line. So sometimes we'll need to talk about that uh, radius of curvature. Now, it turns out in so-called low beta plasmas, that is to say plasmas that don't have too high a pressure, more or less you got the vacuum fields. If the plasma had a lot of pressure, it's going to have a lot of currents flowing in it, might modify the magnetic field. But in some sense, to lowest order, uh, in a uh, near vacuum situation, this becomes of order grad B over B, this whole darn thing. Uh, the way you can kind of intuitively see that, imagine I have a wire coming up here. And uh, let's look at the field lines that are uh, going around it. Okay. So, oh, I'm sorry, a wire carrying a current straight up. Okay. Now, um, which direction is the curvature of those field lines? Well, the curvature vector is from the center out to there. Okay. How big is the magnetic field? in various places. Well, right up close to the wire, you know, I've got a short path length. The magnetic field is the current divided by 2 pi radius. So right up close to the wire, I've got a big magnetic field. And out here, I've got a little magnetic field, right? So which direction is grad B? Well, grad B is in that direction, OK? So you can see that grad B is actually uh, opposite to the direction of the curvature vector. Okay? And that's what that minus sign between radius of curvature and grad B means. Now, with this point in mind, uh, that is to say that we can represent, I, I should have put a little caveat as what I meant by this, is for low pressure, that is to say for this thing, is for low pressure uh, plasmas. So the idea, then, is that most of the time we'll be perfectly satisfied with dealing with, not with, this ugly curvature term, but we will be willing to approximate this as approximately equal to just grad B over B. So uh, then our... Then we have a situation that you remember mu, which was the magnetic moment, OK? Well, let's do it out in yellow so we can see it here. Mu, the magnetic moment, OK, was equal to, was defined as m v perp squared over 2b. So we can then sort of add together the v perp squared here. There's an m v perp squared over 2. 1 over b grad b. And there's an mv parallel squared grad b over b. So they're the same form. It's just it's v parallel squared plus v perp squared over 2. So with that in mind, uh, the way we often start simplifying things then um, is that our drift velocity becomes the usual e naught cross b naught e cross b drift over b naught squared. But then we'll add these other parts, Q B naught squared, B naught uh, cross. Now, adding together these V perp squared parts and the V parallel squared parts, we end up with V parallel squared plus V perp squared over 2 uh, times grad B uh, over B, actually. Do I need another one? I think I need another B down there. Let me make sure. Yes, I do. Um, so that takes care of both the mu grad B, which is the V per squared over 2 part, and the V parallel squared, which is the curvature part. But curvature becomes effectively grad B here. Then we have, finally, plus M dV drift by dt. Now, we're making progress here. Um, now, in some sense, we think of this last term as small, 
uh, because it's a, a frequency on there, it turns out. Oh, I'm sorry, I need a mass in here, too. Uh -huh. Because hmm. um, I had an mv v squared over 2. So, uh, now, so iteratively, what you want to think of is sort of iteratively. Um, what we want to do is say that to lowest order, v drift is this e cross b drift. And so we'll stick that in for that drift velocity. And then we're going to assume that our magnetic field is more or less uniform but we have only the electric field non-uniform in time or space. And so, uh, let's say for V drift approximately equal to E naught cross B naught over B naught squared with B naught approximately constant in time, you know, so that the D by DT doesn't operate on it. What we then get is that V drift is approximately equal to then E naught cross B naught all over B naught squared plus, now I can take all the masses out in front and I can make this M over Q B naught, which is 1 over the cyclotron frequency, and then 1 over B naught times B naught uh, cross. Uh, now, we have one term, which is this uh, V parallel squared curvature drift plus V perp squared over 2 grad B drift, grad B over B naught. And then we've got this last term, D by DT of that, but that becomes uh, D E naught by DT cross B naught all over uh, B squared, B naught squared. Now, again and again, <laughs> uh, you know, this uh, business of we have a, a B, oh, sorry, we're moving off to the side here, right. Sorry. Uh, so we have again and again this business of a B naught cross something cross B naught. And so putting all of this together, all of that, all of that just gives us the perpendicular uh, component of that. What's uh, M over QB naught, or QB naught over M? Yeah, one of our one over omega sub c, right? Okay. So what we can then write all of this is is more or less in our sort of final and more custom, most customary form that our drift velocity has to lowest well to lowest order and most important in some sense the E cross B drift. Then in addition. Okay, I'll, I'll put this together in a, a slightly different form. Um, we then have uh, 1 over omega sub c, and I guess I'll just write it as v parallel squared plus v perp squared over 2. Um, and then this is b naught cross gradient b naught over b naught squared. So that took care of let me make that a little bigger there. So this was our curvature drift, our grad B drift, which is now worked out in a little bit different form here. And then finally, uh, this is would be a minus sign, except that uh, when you take B cross, I'd have to flip this around, and that'd give me a minus sign. The minus sign then makes it a total perpendicular. So you put all this together, and you get a 1 over omega sub t c d by dt of E naught uh, perpendicular, because that's what our B cross B cross does for us, uh, divided by B naught. So this is then our total drift velocity. Am I missing something here? I <laughs> hope not. Um, which has our, uh, our, our more or less standard terms. This is our E cross B drift. The V parallel squared part gives us our curvature drift, where we've made an approximation that the, mag the magnetic field is more or less the vacuum field, not too much plasma current running around. The V perp squared part through mu grad B gives us the so-called grad B drift. And the two together 
give us the inhomogeneous magnetic field drift. This last one could either be called an inertial drift. It's only when the electric field is changing in time that you get anything. Or it is more commonly called a polarization drift. And it is called that because it is a drift that polarizes the plasma. We'll later talk about that in greater detail. So the, uh, then the moral to this story is that, oh, I should have, I guess, say this is all the perpendicular drifts. They're all B cross something, right? So they've got to be perpendicular to the magnetic field. Um, and so this is the customary and most important magnetic field drifts that one gets uh, in a plasma. Now, um, so let's, uh, on the next what I want to do is just kind of uh, summarize perhaps on one sheet of paper so we can kind of see these things, um, our par parallel and perpendicular drifts, and then I want to talk about some time scales for them, how big they are and what they cause and all that sort of stuff. So let's call this, um, now remember we're doing a small gyro radius ordering, so we'll call this summary of small gyro radius orbits. Or, you know, not enough room to say trajectories, so we'll say orbits. Um, what we have in mind is, uh, you know, we have magnetic field lines here like this. Put a little curvature on them, I guess. And we have a, a, a particle gyrating around the magnetic field. Okay. And if we were to plot the density of magnetic field lines, okay, say mod b, as a function of distance x moving in this direction, what we would have is then that the magnetic field has some, I guess I ought to make it higher up here, so maybe I ought to draw another field line in there, another field line in there, and lower down here, less density of field lines. So grad b would be up, right? And what in the small gyro radius approximation, what we mean is that this gyro radius is small compared to that, you know, that gradient scale length. Uh, we'll often talk about a gradient scale length. Say, here's L sub b. That would be sort of the distance over which the magnetic field varies by a factor of two. Let's say something like that. Formally, by the way, we define a one over eh, one over L sub b would be equal to the absolute value of one over b gradient b. So you take the gradient B, divide at some position, then you divide by B, and that gives you some uh, scale length, some typical inhomogeneity scale length. Anyway, um, what our um, analysis uh, showed us, or what, as we did the analysis, I'm sorry, I should say that, we assumed that rho uh, gradient log B was a small quantity, small gyro radii compared to inhomogeneity scale lengths, we also, I didn't really emphasize it, but we uh, assume that the frequency, something's varying in time, it does so slowly compared to the cyclotron frequency. Um, and I wrote down the, the equations, so I won't write those uh, explicitly for parallel and perpendicular, but what, I mean, the whole equation, I'll only write down the parts. Uh, parallel, what we had found was that we had, that the parallel motion was just F equals MA, where well, the mass times acceleration was equal to the parallel electric field, but also we had a mu grad B force, which showed up as a mu B dot del, but here it's of the scalar B, okay, the magnitude of B, and since E is describable from a potential, what we later wrote this as is minus D by DL of Q phi, plus mu b. So it's as if I just have a force is equal to the derivative of a potential type equation. You know, it's, it's motion in a potential. But the poten potential is not just the electrostatic potential phi, but it's also a mu b potential. So the magnetic field acts like a potential uh, for parallel motion along the magnetic field, which conserves the magnetic moment. Now, perpendicular what we have found is that the perpendicular drift velocity was equal to uh, E naught 
cross b naught all over b naught squared and then we have 1 over q b naught squared uh, b naught cross and then we had a mu grad b force a curvature force mv parallel squared b dot del b and then finally our uh, inertial force m dv drift by dt and this became approximately our just our e cross b drift and then plus v parallel squared plus v perp squared over 2 omega sub c uh, b naught cross gradient b naught divided by b naught squared and finally plus which was our curvature and grad b drift and finally our inertial or polarization drift term 1 over omega sub c d by dt of e naught perpendicular divided by b naught. So in some sense that's uh, all that happens. Now next thing I want to do is just illustrate the time scales and length scales for these various types of motion. Okay? So to do that I'll consider a certain type of plasma, namely a sort of like magnetic mirror plasma uh, the Phaedrus experiment, for instance, over in the bottom of ERB uh, is of the Phaedrus tandem mirror experiment is of that type. So what I want to do is consider these equations, and for simplicity, I'll not have any potential at all. I'll just knock off the E cross B in the potential part, uh, and we'll only consider bouncing and gyro motion, uh, bouncing along a field line, and drifting because of the gradient in the magnetic field. Okay? So let's, uh, um, just to get some typical uh, sort of uh, time and length scales, um, so let's call this time length um, scales for, let's call it components, of particle motion. And I'm actually only going to consider an ion. Uh, you know, you can do it for electrons as well, but it's just a little bit different is all. Okay, so what I'll consider is a magnetic field is equal to one Tesla, or 10 kilogauss, of course. Um, that gives me, as we did before, an ion cyclotron frequency of approximately 10 to the 8th per second. That's actually a radian, not a hertz, a cycles per second frequency, by the way. Uh, we'll consider an ion temperature of 500 electron volts. Nice hot plasma. And it turns out that will give us, we did this before, so I won't do it again, an ion thermal velocity of about 3 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. Um, this then gives us an ion gyro radius, which is this V thermal ion over omega ci of approximately you know, 3 times 10 to the fifth divided by 10 to the eighth is about 3 times 10 to the minus 3 meters, or that's approximately 0.3 centimeters. Um, now, uh, we need to consider, so these are the properties of the plasma, and we need then to have some consideration of the particular scale lengths for the magnetic field. And so for that, let's consider a single magnetic mirror or cell, people might call it. And for that, what we will imagine, trying to decide how much to get on one page here, um, is that we have a coil, okay, um, or a pair of coils, sorry, and 
I'm trying to indicate the direction of current here. So, you know, it's going this way. And those will create a magnetic field structure right down the center. There's a nice straight field line. But off axis, there will be a field line. The field lines sort of do this. These things are always hard to draw very accurately. So uh, these are the magnetic field lines in that magnetic mirror machine. Now, as we went through our various components of the magnetic field, uh, or I'm sorry, of the motion, our fastest and smallest scale motion was the gyro motion. Okay? And what that meant, again, if I'm on, say, this field line, is the particle is gyrating around that field line. And what is the, um, let's call it, time scale for that gyration? That would be 1 over the frequency of gyration. Hence, it would be that delta t is approximately 1 over omega sub c. Omega sub c was my cyclotron frequency. Now, we just calculated the cyclotron frequency here, and we had that that was 10 to the 8 seconds, 10 to the 8th per second. So 1 over omega sub c turns out to be 10 to the minus 8 seconds, 10 nanoseconds. That's pretty fast. You know, most things we're going to look at are tenths of a second we're trying to understand this plasma on. So this is going to be a very fast motion. And how fast, how far, sorry, do these particles move off of the field line? Well, their delta x, let me call it perpendicular, because they're gyrating around the field line, is about the gyro radius, which, you know, we just estimated for the particular parameters I'm after, is about three-tenths of a centimeter. Okay? We'll violate our dictum a little bit if we're using MKS to, uh, you know, at least write it in units that we can measure. Okay, so, <coughs> so what we have happening on some very fast time scale, 10 nanoseconds, okay, the particles, these ions gyrate around a field line. Now, what do they do? Well, they gyrate around a field line, and you remember they get magnetic mirrored, okay? whenever the magnetic field, remember because the magnetic field here is biggest in the mirrors, okay, medium at the center, and very small off axis. So if I move along the field line, okay, I hopefully well, will consider a particle for which I will be hitting a magnetic mirror. I run out of parallel energy. Now, remember when we did that, we had that effectively I could look at the situation that then I had a magnetic field, mu b, a, a potential. Okay, the particle gets trapped in a magnetic potential, actually. And, you know, that potential looks uh, sort of like this. And what I'm saying by, say, on this field line is, you know, we're coming down to here, and this one is coming down to here. And what we have is along that field line, which we'll call that distance L along the field line, I have this particle is going to be bouncing back and forth. Okay, so it's going to have a loop motion, let's say. Now, since, you know, now the particle is going to gyrate very rapidly and it's going to bounce back and forth. It's okay. So we'll call our next time scale, which is somewhat disparate, okay, so our bounce motion time scale, what would be the time scale? Just if, you know, you had a little particle here in a magnetic mirror, or think of this as just an arbitrary potential, what would be the time scale? Well, you know, roughly speaking, delta t would be the length of it, so there's some sort of characteristic length here, divided by the thermal velocity right at the center. Okay. So it's sort of length over V thermal, and then it'll bounce back and forth, and so forth and so on. Um, well, now's where I've got to get a little bit specific. Uh, turns out my mirror machine is going to be one meter long, okay? You know, we, we would hate to take it some awkward unit that I'd have to calculate something accurately for. We, we're only interested in magnitudes here. So this is one meter 
and the ion thermal velocity was of the order of 3 times 10 to the fifth uh, meters per second. Okay. And so if I uh, divide that, I'll get um, uh, like this uh, 0.3 times 10 to the uh, sixth meters a second. And then 0.3 into 1 is obviously 3, right? That's 3.16, but something or other. But, you know, for this accuracy, we're perfectly satisfied with that. And uh, so this turns out to be 3 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds, 3 microseconds. So it's 30 times longer than that. I'm sorry, 300 times longer than that. So I'm taking 300 gyro orbits or gyrations on my gyro motion per bounce. So 300 of these little twisties, okay, before I go down and bounce and come back. How far do I go in this motion, this parallel motion? Uh, I call that delta x perp. Well, I go delta x parallel of the order of this length L, okay, because I'm just bouncing back and forth, and that's of the order of one meter, okay? What else happens? Well, the final thing that happens on longer time scale is the so-called drift motion. Okay. Now, so as this particle goes back and forth, okay, so he's gyrating around, but now we don't worry about the details of the gyro motion. We just consider the guiding center moving back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But as he does that, as the particle does that, he also drifts in the B cross grad B direction. Which direction is B cross grad B? Well, let's just suppose I'm right about here, okay? And uh, what's going to happen here? Well, grad B, okay, if I was right there, grad B is, B is smaller out here than it is, you know, there. And so my grad B is in this direction, okay? B is in this direction. So which direction is B cross grad B in? Well, it's azimuthal, okay? Now, this I always is hopeless to draw, but if I try to project this orbit down here, what I try to say is the particle guiding center is moving back and forth, but it's drifting, okay, in the theta direction, V drift in the theta direction, where theta is the angular direction up here. Okay? Now, um, so if I wanted to have a frequency to associate with this drift motion, okay? I, I like, you know, we've gotten down to estimating time scales, so I'd like to say that here again, that the delta t, the time scale of interest, is of order 1 over some drift frequency. What would that drift frequency be? Well, that drift frequency would be our drift velocity, b cross grad b drift velocity, divided by some distance, by, by units, okay? What distance would I like to take there? Well, it's, it's drifting in the azimuthal direction, and it's doing so at some radius r, okay? There's some radius. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of bouncing back and forth, and I'm some distance and radius off of the center magnetic axis, it's called, uh, of the center of this, okay? Now, I have to give you another number now. So it turns out I'll choose that my radius is about 0.1 meters. Just so happens. Now, how do I calculate that V-drift? Well, we go back to our little formula here, and we had that our drift velocity, uh, there's no electric field, and there's no time-dependent electric field, and so it's sort of V-thermal squared over gyro frequency, but one V-thermal over gyro frequency is a gyro radius, okay? And then there's an additional V-thermal. And then this B cross grad B, you remember, we figured out the direction. It's in the azimuthal drift direction. And as magnitude, it's sort of 1 over some gradient scale length perpendicular. And that was sort of that curvature gradient scale length. Okay? So to go back then, what we would have 
is that this drift velocity, eh, wrong size, wrong pen here, this drift velocity would then be V thermal times gyro radius over curvature length. But then, uh, and my little r comes in here like this. So in magnitude, uh, if you now just work out that, oh, and I need to, I guess I need to tell you another piece of information. What do you think I ought to take for a curvature scale for this type of machine? Well, it turns out if you just kind of look at it geometrically, uh, if I had to have the curvature of this field line right there, I'd have to put a point down about here, and in distance, that's about the same as the length of the device. So I like one meter, to make a long story short. Okay. Now, um, so you, you just uh, work out these numbers, um, so to speak, and it turns out that this time scale, if you just put, well, I'll put it over here. So the thermal velocity is 3 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. The radius r is about um, uh, uh, 0 0.1 meter. The gyro radius is 0 0.3, well, times 10 to the minus 2. And the radius of curvature is 1. And so uh, 0 0.3 times 1 is 1. And this is 10 to the 3 divided by 0 0.1 is 10 to the 4. And so 1 over that is about 10 to the minus 4 seconds. So the net result of this is that gyro motion takes place in 10 nanoseconds, okay? 10 nanoseconds jiggle or around the field line. Bouncing back and forth takes on the order of 3 microseconds. Drifting, okay, it's drifting. Again, it's this drift motion, but it's drifting, and in doing so, it's drifting around this way, okay? Is taking about 10 micros, or I'm sorry, is taking about 100 microseconds. Okay, so there's a hierarchy of time scales here: nanoseconds, microseconds, almost milliseconds. Okay, for this particular sort of of set of numbers that I'm giving you. Um, notice this is very similar to the Earth's magnetic field. It's a mirror machine, also of a different type, and one of our problems goes into that, of course. Now. How far do these particles go along, go in the drift in the perpendicular direction? Well, if I've done what's called an axisymmetric mirror machine, which means that these two mirrors are lined in the same planes, you know, the, in parallel planes, then it turns out that azimuthal drift will come back on itself, and and it'll it'll be closed. But that's not always the case. Okay, could be that if I have mirrors that are jiggled or something. I'll drift off in some oddball direction. So I didn't, I don't really know how to put, I'll put it over here. So you can say that delta x perp here, or delta x theta is actually what it is, is of the order of 2 pi r, because it's going to drift around at this radius surface of, of 0.1 meters, way about 0 0.6 meters. But it could go to infinity. It could drift off in some oddball direction if I didn't have such symmetric fields, it turns out. So the moral to this story is that gyro motion is fast, but small distance. Bounce motion is a little bit slower, uh, but it you know goes over the whatever that ma magnetic inhomogeneity length the long field lines is. And then drift motion is slower yet, uh, and hopefully closes on itself, but doesn't always close on itself. And what we get into in plasma physics is asking the question, well, if I'm interested in frequencies, oscillations of the natural modes of oscillation of plasma or various things, on which sort of time scale are they? And hence, what sort of physics do I have to consider for the particle orbits? Only their gyro motion, only their bounce motion, only their drift motion. So in a minute here, we'll uh, go with this a little bit further and talk about the action uh, action integral variables and constants of the motion that one gets into to describe these processes. So.